You're listening to episode number 131 of Becoming You Again. I am your host, Karen Nelson, and I am so happy you're here. Welcome to Becoming You Again, the podcast to help you with your mental and emotional well being during and after divorce. This is where you learn to overcome the grief and trauma of your divorce. We're going to do that by reconnecting with yourself creating lasting emotional resilience and living a truly independent life so that your life can be even better than when you were married. I'm your host, Karen Nelson. I am so excited for today's episode. And actually, it's going to be a two-part episode. So I'm very excited for this week's episode and next week's episode. I have an amazing guest today. Her name is Lauren Fair. You're going to meet her in just a minute and you listen to our incredible conversation that was so incredible and so long that I actually had to split it into two different podcasts because we talk about so many amazing things. But let me just give you a very quick snippet of what we talk about. Lauren is an accomplished woman who is a family law attorney and also a certified divorce coach and life coach. In the first half of this episode, which you're going to have the privilege of listening to in just a minute, you're going to hear about Lauren's background. You are going to hear some of her do's and don'ts when it comes to divorce from a legal standpoint. And we're also going to talk about the difference between being a divorce coach and being a grief coach and how each one has their own benefits that can help you as you go through your divorce. And that's just this episode. Stay tuned for next week where you will get the second half of our amazing conversation. I am so excited to share with you both of these episodes. So without further ado, here is the first half of my conversation with Lauren Fair. Welcome back to the podcast, my lovely ladies. I'm so excited for you to meet my guest today. She is Lauren Fair, and she is an amazing divorce coach, but also she has the background of being a lawyer. And I'm going to let her just kind of introduce herself and tell you as much as she wants about her story and who she is. So Lauren, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Oh, thank you, Karen, for inviting me on. I'm really excited to be here and chat with you and your ladies. Yeah. So can you tell my audience just a little bit more about you and maybe even share as much of your story as you would like about coaching and about becoming a lawyer and anything else that you want us to know about you? Sure. Yeah. So I am a family law attorney. I'm based in San Diego, California. I've been working in the area of family law in California since about 2007. And I am certified by the California State Bar Board of Legal Specialization as a specialist in the area of family law since 2014. And uh, together with my law partner, we own a uh, boutique family law firm in San Diego called Fercador APC. And in addition to practicing family law, I am also a trained family law mediator, a certified divorce coach and a master certified life coach. So personally right now, what I spend most of my days doing with that kind of like blend of <laughs> activities that I, I I've love come to be involved in, I um, I spend a lot of time managing the law firm um, and, you know, the staff and the operations of it basically. And in terms of like actual substantive family law work, I do a lot of consulting um, and helping clients resolve their divorces out of court as much as possible. I love that. I think that's, I think that's so beneficial for, I mean, you would know even more than me because you work in the law, the, you know, the system and, but I think being able to settle out of court, I just can't see a better advantage to that. And and you tell me your opinion on that, but like, it just seems like there's so much of an advantage to that for both sides. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I always approach cases with an eye for, you know, how can we settle this reasonably outside of court? Um, because it allows, I think the clients to have a better experience with the divorce process to have some control over what the outcome is right? Because they have to live with what that outcome is and how that's going to impact their yeah. daily lives going forward post-divorce. And I really advocate for having as much control over what that looks like as possible. And whenever you go to court, you give up that control mm. to the judge, you know, who 
is doing the best that they can, right? Yeah. With the the issue is though, the courts are underfunded, um, and overburdened with numbers of cases in many areas. Certainly in San Diego, and definitely in in various areas around the country, that's true as well. Um, and you know they don't have a lot of time to spend on the case. They're never going to know your family as well yeah. as you do, and so. I really like to look at, you know, what are the other options other than that and having going to court and having a judge make a decision for you about these really sensitive matters, you know, I mean, where your children are going to, you know, put their head at night to sleep um, and when, right. Yeah. Uh, just trying to have that be something that you maintain as much control over within your family as possible is just something I think is really important. Yeah, I totally agree. When I went through my divorce, uh, it was actually pretty easy. Like sometimes I, I feel like I can't offer women advice when it comes to, should I go to mediation? Should I go to court? Because mine was so amicable. We completely just agreed on splitting everything 50, 50 time with the kids, finances, all of that. So it was very, it was a very simple process for me and my ex, but I know that that is very much not the usual normal case when it comes to divorce. And so I love this idea of having women, women, especially like most of my clients are women. And I don't know you, maybe you have a good mix of the two, but I know for women that can be part of the scary thing is feeling like you have no control and no say over where your kids go, how much time you get to spend with them, the finances that are coming to you after the divorce. And maybe it's that same way for men as well, who maybe feel out of control. Like they feel like they're losing all of their finances. If, you know, if that's kind of the uh, stereotypical story of divorce where men are making more money than the women and the women are losing time with their kids who they often spent more time with overall. But tell me, tell me your uh, thoughts on that of like, is it more of, a balance that you find between men and women feeling the same and, and fearing the same thing. Yeah. I think uncertainty is a big one. Yeah. Um, the common feelings that I see come up in clients, I think both in the coaching realm, as well as in the law practice is fear of the unknown. Yes. Um, overwhelm is a big one. Um, and then, you know, it's a mixture of, of other, I think, emotions that come up as part of the grief process, you know, yes, sadness and anger, sometimes depression, um, and all of those emotions can really manifest themselves in different ways in terms of what we see about, you know, how long cases take, how much they cost, right? Because those emotions translate into behaviors in the parks, mm, right? It's so true. Yeah. And it's so normal for that to be happening, right? Like, for example, um, sometimes, you know, if you're in a space of, uh, you know, being feeling like you were blindsided, right? And with the divorce filing, and you're not really sure, you know, how we got here, and yeah. uh, let alone like having to, you know, face now, what do we do and all of the uncertainty that comes with that. And yeah. so sometimes that can look like avoidance for the process, right. Or kind of doing the bare minimum, you know, in the legal process in the beginning, because they're emotionally trying to catch up to where, you know, the partner is, yeah. uh, because I find that usually both spouses are not at the same place emotionally in terms of we processing the divorce you know, yeah. or the separation, what led to the separation, that kind of thing. And when they're not in the same place, you know, that can impact uh, things like, you know, how long it takes and how much it costs. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think that what you mentioned earlier is, is very common is there's a lot of focus on, you know, what is being lost in the process. Um, and really, <laughs> to be honest, I mean, family court is really not a place where there's a lot of winning involved. It yeah. really is a place where we're trying to minimize the losses for both parties. Mm. So it's really degrees of losing in most cases. Um, because, you know, everyone is giving something up in the process, right? Time with your kids, money that you had in one household doesn't go as far as it does in two, yeah. right? But there's also so much to be gained on the other side of it. But in the short term, it's really easy, you know, for our minds to focus only on 
the things that we're losing. And sometimes yes. I think we lose sight of the things that we're gaining as well. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing to remember because like I teach my clients a lot about this idea of 50, 50 in all things, right. Of like emotionally 50, 50 of like, there's going to be good and there's going to be get bad things in, in all of it and everything that we experience in a life. And when you can kind of widen your lens and think about your divorce in that same way too, I really like how you put that of like, it's not that somebody is winning in this, you know, situation of a divorce. It's that we're trying to minimize the losses, but then on the other side of that, there can be some really amazing things that can yeah. go on as well. Yeah, uh, I, I know for my own experience in my divorce, like, yes, of course I, I, you know, have lost time with my kids and, uh, you know, just all the things that go into the loss of the end of that relationship, the end of that marriage. Mm -hmm. And I have watched my ex-husband grow in his ability to parent and become this really amazing father, which I feel like he never really stepped into or embraced while we were married. And not that every husband or ex-husband does that, but I love that my ex has been able to do that and has a, a much stronger relationship with our kids than I feel like he ever had before our divorce. And at the same time, I've been able to kind of expand and grow myself and my own personal love for myself and my own ability to step into my own power and, you know, become my own person, which was, very, I felt very stifled about that yeah. in my own marriage. And I think, like you said, there's going to be losses, but there's also going to be so much that you can gain outside of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, you have been able to kind of identify those areas for you that, are better now post-divorce, you yeah. know, than, than they were previously. And like these areas where you both have grown personally because of having to go through this transition and make those changes. Yeah. So Lauren, since you are a lawyer, but you are also a coach, what would you say, are there any like do's and don'ts when it comes to like a legal perspective that you would maybe offer to just the general population of somebody who might be going through a divorce right now? Yes, definitely. And I think, although these are coming from a legal perspective, I, I can't help but have a, a little bit of coaching color. I think in my you response. should. I 100% think you should please <laughs> add it in because I think, I honestly think like, of course it's, it's amazing to have a good lawyer in like, in your, in your corner. I think that's an important part of it. But for me, a divorce coach who is so much about the mental and emotional aspect, that's what I focus on like all the time on my podcast. So I love having your perspective because you have both and you can meld them together, you know, in this beautiful way. And so I'm so excited to hear your advice right now. Okay. Awesome. So I think where I'd start is a do would be to slow down and really consider what is the outcome that is going to be the most important to you at the end of this? You have a much better chance at hitting whatever that target is if we know where we're aiming from the yes. beginning. Many of the conversations and the decisions that you make early on in the process, sometimes even before the legal process starts, um, can affect the level of conflict and the length and the cost of the proceeding as well as, you know, what is your co-parenting relationship going to look like when this is all done? Yeah. And I find that particularly as a lawyer, a lot of the initial communications that I have from potential clients come in situations where they're in a panic or it's a knee-jerk sort of reaction to usually some sort of conflict that just happened, yeah. right? Whether it's earlier that day or the day before, you know, it might be something that, you know, they've been thinking about for a while, um, but it, they only kind of reach out in that moment of, you know, an acute situation that yes. has driven them to actually go forward with making that step to reach out to an attorney. And, Certainly, if you are in a situation where you feel like you need immediate information and protection, then, you know, you should certainly reach out to an attorney Absolutely. whenever you need that. But <clears throat> usually when you're in that emotional state that has you making that panicked phone call, 
it's not necessarily the most grounded state to be making good decisions for the long term from. Yes. I've talked about this on my podcast before, and you and I both just finished up this trauma certification program, which is where I met you. And I'm so excited that I was able to connect with you through there. And so I've talked about that a lot of like really allowing your body to become grounded so that you can kind of turn your prefrontal cortex back online. Because when we are in that more heightened state of a nervous system, we do make like, as you say, like knee jerk decisions over things that can impact truly the rest of our lives. And that is not necessarily the, the state that you want to be in to make these kind of important decisions that are going to be coming up as you go through a divorce. Right. Yeah. Because when your prefrontal cortex is sort of offline and yeah. you're operating from this more primitive portion of your brain that is driven by those negative emotions that, yeah. you know, often come up in divorce where we're feeling threatened, right? Yes. Um, then, you know, you're more likely to, for example, hire the first lawyer that you talk to simply because they were available and talked to you, right? In that moment where you were panicked and that might not be the wrong person to choose, but sometimes we're just really not in the best place to assess that at that moment. Yes. And then, you know, that you may find out a short time later, perhaps that wasn't the right attorney for you. And then, you know, that's already created an impact for you potentially financially. And also maybe some decisions that were made in terms of the legal process up front that now, you know, maybe you're thinking you want to walk back. Yes. Um, and, you know, I think the traditional approach in terms of divorce and involving attorneys in the divorce process has been, all right, I've decided I want to get a divorce. I'm just going to, you know, hire an attorney and they're going to file papers and they're going to serve my spouse and I'm going to let them just handle this whole thing for me. Right. Yeah. Um, that's just not the only way of doing it anymore. And sometimes that might be the right approach based on your case. Um, but in many cases, there are other options that are available that oftentimes I find are more in line with the client's ultimate goals, which is, you know, getting through the process as quickly as possible with the least financial resources spent on the process, um, doing the least amount of, you know, emotional harm to their children in the yeah. process, et cetera. So, you know, I think this piece of, you know, slowing down and really thinking about, okay, what in the long term is really going to be most important to me here? And then tailoring your approach to the process based on the target that you want to hit at the end, you know, is a really big um, do that I would, <laughs> I would highlight for you. I love that. I think yeah. that's so smart because I think you're absolutely right. We often will just like, we're so emotional going, you know, whether it's, we've found out about an affair or we're just tired of putting up with all the bullshit or like whatever, right. There's yeah. so many other reasons why people get divorced, but in that emotional state, we're just like throwing darts at, we don't even know where we have no idea where that target is. And so I love this idea of just like slowing down, taking a breath, and figuring it out, like, where do I, where am I headed? What am I shooting for? What is the end goal here? That is yeah. gold, gold advice. Love it. <laughs> what else? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I alluded to it a moment ago, but I think, you know, just to be really clear about it, I think, you know, there are lots of different ways to approach the legal process now that there is not a ton of education available about upfront. And so really, you know, getting the information that you need to understand in your jurisdiction, what are the processes that are available to me to work through the legal process? And what, you know, what are the costs attendant to all those different processes yeah. um, and the pros and cons to each and making a really intentional decision around that upfront is really important because, you know, 
you may only have a certain degree of control over whether that's the process that ultimately gets selected. So for example, mediation is an option and that's a voluntary process. So your spouse would need to agree, right. Mm. To participate in that process right. in most situations. I mean, there are times when there is some court connected mediation that occurs in certain jurisdictions, um, Sometimes, for example, related to custody issues, there may be some compulsory mediation for limited issues in certain uh, places, but I'm talking about where you choose to put the entire, you know, case through mediation yeah. with the goal of reaching a global agreement on and everything um, from the beginning. So that is something that you've got to agree to. And so if you know up front, though, here's what I would like to do you know, you can prepare yourself for having that conversation with your spouse in a way that sets you up to, you know, have the best chance of them agreeing with that in the beginning. Right. Um, and, you know, it's a situation where depending on what the process is that you want to adopt, you can try the one that most closely fits, you know, what your goals are. And sometimes that, you know, is mediation. That's a common um, option that I see a lot of women selecting these days. Yeah. Um, and if it doesn't work, you always have the option of, you know, moving to that next level of process that might, you know, involve a little bit more adversarialness or cost, et cetera. But at least, you know, you've sort of tried, you know, one of the other options, but yeah. it's really case specific as to what the right decision is because it's not, you know, always the same starting point for every case based on the dynamics of that case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. An important thing that comes into that is kind of knowing, again, it goes back to that, what what's the end goal that I want and kind of knowing your own self and what you feel is going to be best for you. And I love this idea of like, not necessarily going straight to what we've all kind of thought of when it comes to divorce is like, I'm, it's going to the courts. That's just the way it is. But understanding that, as you say, there are so many other options that maybe haven't been available in the past and that are really coming to the forefront. I may be jumping ahead just a little bit, but I saw in a post that you put out a while ago that the American Bar Association is recognizing as a way to resolve divorce disputes, this idea of mediating with a divorce coach. And that that is another alternative as well as probably other things that I'm, I clearly don't have the background or knowledge on, but talk more about that, this idea of being able to resolve things in, and you've kind of already kind of gone into some explanation of it, but anything else that you might want to add about not necessarily going like zero to 100, which 100 would be the court system, right? And your judge who's deciding everything for you, but like maybe taking that baby step of like, let's try this. Hopefully my, I can get my ex or my soon to be ex on board and let's see if this works for us. And if not, what does that lead to? What's our next step? But at least we tried, like you just kind of laid out for us. Exactly. Yeah. So divorce coaching is recognized by the American Bar Association as an alternative dispute resolution process. Um, I'll just give you the definition that the ABA provides for divorce coaching. And that is divorce coaching is a flexible goal-oriented process designed to support, motivate, and guide people through divorce to help them make the best possible decisions for their future based on their particular interests, needs, and concerns. Um, and so kind of what that really translates to in terms of the work that I do with clients um, is I utilize an ADR-based coaching framework that prepares clients to have the skills and strategies that they need to do kind of a whole host of things throughout the divorce process to successfully engage in it. And so an example of that would be um, recognizing and managing conflict. So we identify specific areas of conflict, increase awareness of like, the client's conflict style, their spouse's conflict style, and maybe unhealthy patterns that they've engaged in in the past, and opportunities for changing that dynamic. Because wow. especially if they have children, you know, a lot, usually there are 
some of these unhealthy patterns and conflict uh, kind of dynamics that have contributed to the breakdown of the marriage. And if they go unaddressed, they continue post-divorce yes. and oftentimes worsen because they're not on the same page anymore. Right. You know, they're not together any, any longer, their interests diverge further. And so, you know, it can be really helpful to be able to gain that awareness around the conflict issues and see where there are opportunities to change them. And then where the client wants to make a change, then we look at, you know, what are the strategies that we can employ to make those changes? Because even though I'm only coaching one spouse, one person does have the power to influence the dynamic. Mm, I right? love that. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, part of this process also involves, you know, working on the emotional regulation that you need in order to disrupt those conflict patterns. Um, we develop effective client communication skills and establish a structure to manage conflict through the divorce process. And like I said, also into those future co-parenting relationships. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's one of the key differences, um, with, you know, utilizing an ADR based coaching framework is we're really looking at how can we, um, reduce or manage conflict. Yeah. I love that. I think that's going to be, and I don't know how, I mean, I'm from Utah, you're from San Diego. So I haven't heard very much talk about this, mm -hmm. this idea of like, cause I, I consider myself a divorce coach, but I've, I've actually kind of shifted to recognize myself more as a grief coach because I, like I said earlier, am really focused on the mental and emotional needs of my client, not necessarily like looking at the conflict and uh, between the two parties and trying, you know, how best to work that into the actual divorce process, which I think is so needed and so necessary when it comes to going through something as emotionally charged as a divorce and to have these skills in your back pocket and to be able to move forward, knowing the direction that you want to go in. And then also like, how can I best show up for myself, but how can I prepare myself to kind of enter this, this not, I don't want to say war because not every divorce is a war, mm -hmm. but this, like this engagement with my soon to be ex in a more well-rounded in a more informed way to where I'm showing up as my best self. And I know how to handle what they are possibly going to throw at me. Yes. I think that is going to be so helpful for so many people who find themselves in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. And so is what you're doing with the grief, you know, work that you're doing with clients, because like I mentioned a bit earlier, it it shows up so much in the divorce process, right? Where each spouse is with the grief process and yeah. kind of, you know, how that's manifesting itself. And it's not a linear process. So, you know, you, you kind of might find yourself in, in different stages of it throughout the process. And yeah. I think a lot of the time that when you're going through it, you're not really aware that's what's happening though. And if you can get support to really better understand that, um, it, I think allows access to a lot of self-compassion and a lot of, you know, personal growth that can happen with it. And so I think it's important, you know, when people are, um, looking for a divorce coach to kind of really know for themselves. And, and sometimes a coach can help them uncover that. Like, where am I really wanting the support in this yeah. process the most? And that can kind of help, you know, determine, you know, what the, the best kind of approach for them might be. Um, so, you know, I think some other ways that, you know, there's probably a lot of overlap in, in ways that we're able to help people. Um, and, you know, one of those things too, I think is, you know, looking at values-based decision-making. Yes. Um, because divorce really involves a series of difficult decisions that need to be made <laughs> when they're in grief, Karen. You know, like an, I mean, such an understatement like these. <laughs> yeah. Very important, very, <laughs> things that are going to like just, move through the rest of your life kind of a decisions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think too, 
um, you know, I'm thinking about one client I've worked with recently where, you know, I think for, for her, she was just, you know, in this stage of grief that really was making it difficult for her to be prepared and, and able to engage in the divorce process. That was sort of a train that was already moving, you know, that, she wasn't really able to get off of, you yeah. know, um, while also still protecting her legal interests and kind of allowing the process to go, um, you know, in a, in the way that she most wanted, which was, you know, in a way that had the conflict being as minimal as possible and resolving it out of court, et cetera. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think there's, in that situation, you know, a need for, you know, both coaching around the process you know, getting the education that you need for understanding the process and your options in it, which is really the part that I focus most on with clients. Yeah. Um, but then there's also this in tandem need for, you know, handling the grief and um, all of the impact that that's having, you know, in the ability to just, you know, do what you need to do in the day in addition to, you know, engaging in the divorce process. Yeah. That, that is smart. It, all I can envision, and I'm not even like a sports person, like at all. I understand some sports, but what I'm envisioning is like, we've got the coach on the sideline of a basketball game, right? And that's the divorce coach who's walking you through all of the process, all of the things that you need to know to go into the game and like, do your best. And then you've got like, in the after hours, you've got your coach who's helping you with your free throws. And that's like the grief coach who's helping you through like the emotional minutia of the things that are happening within you, the things that you're really struggling with that is kind of keeping you stuck and kind of keeping you from being able to show up as your best self as you go through this crazy process of the divorce and what that ends up being. So right. I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of overlap, but there's a, a place for each specific thing. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And also a thing that, you know, you as the individual gets to recognize for yourself, where do I need the more of the focus right now? Maybe it's for both. Maybe it's one, maybe it's the other, maybe at the beginning it's for the divorce coach, maybe later it's for the grief or vice versa. But yeah. I think that is something that you can tap into to know for yourself, what is going to be the best route for you. Right. Exactly. There you have it. That was the first half of my amazing conversation with Lauren Fair. Make sure you tune in to next week's episode, which is the continuation of my conversation with Lauren, where we talk more about the ADR-based coaching and how that can be beneficial to you as you go through your divorce. We also talk about the keys to successfully navigating the transition between being married and being divorced and being able to move forward from there. And we also talk about how to create safety and space to get the best answer for yourself when it comes to deciding on whether or not you should actually get divorced. You're also going to hear as a bonus at the end of next week's episode, Lauren's top tips to empowering women who are moving through the divorce process. Make sure and tune in to hear the second half of this incredible conversation. Hi friend, I'm so glad you're here and thanks for listening. I wanted to let you know that if you're wanting more, a way to make deeper, more lasting change, then working one-on-one -on -one with me as your coach may be exactly what you need. Together, we'll take everything you're learning in the podcast and implement it in your life with weekly coaching, real life practice, and practical guidance. To learn more about how to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, go to karennelsoncoaching.com. That's www.karinnelsoncoaching.com. Thanks for listening. If this podcast agreed with you in any way, please take a minute to follow and give me a rating wherever you listen to podcasts. And for more details about how I can help you live an even better life than when you were married, make sure and check out the full show notes by clicking the link in the description.